when I call. Coming over here to help us, praise the Lord. We're blessed at both campuses, and sometimes they fill in on both and do double duty, and we just pray God will double bless them, amen? So for their sacrifices. Uh, just a note, as you notice, Brother Joe's not in the pulpit today. He talked to him yesterday, and he asked me to read this letter to the congregation, and so uh, I'll read this from him. It says, Dear family, I cannot thank you enough for all your prayers for my family at this time. Many of you know that we cut our Belize trip short and came home due to the severe health issues with my stepfather. We got off the plane and headed home to clean clothes and get clean clothes and drive a late night drive to San Angelo. The family has gathered, had gathered all things as things looked very bad for him. Uh, we had been on, he had been on a respirator for a few days and coming off it may be fatal. The first couple of days off of it were extremely difficult and the doctors gave us permission to take him home to be with family. He has been here for two days now and has stabilized somewhat. I just didn't feel I could leave my 84-year-old mother and my sister to handle this alone, so I postponed coming home until Monday afternoon. None of us knew, know uh, that appointed time we will step into the presence of God. The doctors said anywhere from three days to a month or so. That is their estimation, but God certainly knows. Our prayer is that for this faithful pastor, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, that when his time arrives, it will be a peaceful and glorious transition. One day I will share the impact that he has personally on our Believer's Fellowship, as he has always been a very reliable source of prayer and counsel for your pastor. My mom and family all send their love and appreciation for your prayers and love. I love you and thank God often for the blessing of pastoring this great church. Signed, Brother Joe Arms. So. Praise the Lord. Let's have a word of prayer as a church family for them during this time. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we, we lift up Brother L.R. to you. Father, we pray that you would touch him, minister to him. Father, we know you can do the impossible and raise him up. Father God, you're God. And if that's what your will is, glad that you would just heal him, Lord. But Lord, uh, we just pray, if not, Lord, you would just comfort him, minister to him. Lord, allow these days to be grand and glorious and that you would just touch his body. And Lord, uh, you know, there won't be any pain and you just... Just blessing during this time. Bless his family. God, minister them. Allow this time that they're with him to be a glorious time and give them safety as they travel. And just bless them, Lord God, during this time as our church family lifts them up. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, this morning, uh, I don't know if you know, heard about the, the three burly guys that pulled into the truck stop with their big three choppers. They pulled on in there and decided they'd go ahead and eat. You know, so they got off their bikes and went in there, and they saw this little wiry man eating by himself, real small little man eating his meal. And so one of them took the cigarette out of their mouth and stuck it in his mashed potatoes. The other one knocked his coffee off and sported, poured it right in his lap. The other one slapped his hat off his head, and he didn't do a thing. He just got his ticket and went on and paid. And so they went on to their seat, and the waitress came up to them to take their order, and they all yelled out. They said, ah, that guy over there, he wasn't much of a man, was he? And the waitress looked out the window as she was saying, he said, well, he's not much of a truck driver either. He just ran over three motorcycles. So, <laughs> so you know, we, we do experience difficulty. Matter of fact, some of you are going through difficulty that you probably couldn't even put it into words except, Brother Tim, it, it's like a mountain. It's just like a mountain. I, I've prayed about it. it. It's just something in my life I can't get around, I can't get through. It's just... I push against it, but with all my might, it's like a mountain. It won't move out of my life. I've been praying and believing God. It won't change. It's my, either my health or my finances or relationships or a child or a wife or a mother or whatever the case may be. It's something in your life that just doesn't seem to want to move. And if you think, man, if this could just move out of the way, I could just walk through with victory. Well, that's what we're going to talk about this morning is moving your mountain. You say, what is my mountain? You know what your mountain is. And if you don't have a mountain this morning, <laughs> give it a little time. <laughs> Probably next week or two, you'll get one and you'll have all the notes to be able to know what to do. But I would hasten to say, uh, if I'm the only one up here with some mountains, praise God, I'm going to preach to myself because I need to hear this because I, I don't like those mountains and uh, 
you know. Many times those molehills move into mountains and they're there. And what do you do? Well, that's what we're going to talk about this morning is how to get, push that mountain, get that mountain out of the way. And we'll look at a particular verse in, in Mark 11. And we're going to break this little passage down. First of all, I call it the cursing. In Mark 11:12, 12, it said, On the next day when they, went, when they left Bethany, he became hungry. That is, he, Jesus. Jesus got hungry. He was God in flesh. If you don't think those nails hurt, they hurt. You don't think the whip hurt, it hurt. He was God in flesh, and he also got hungry. Seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples were listening. He said, well, how do you call that cursing? Well, Peter says later, the fig tree which you cursed to Jesus. So Jesus cursed this fig tree. So what's the deal? Well, he's going down the road, and there were fig trees by the side of the road which were open game to anybody who wasn't stealing anything. You know, they were there along the roadside. That was free for anybody to take. And you say, what well, says there it was, wasn't the season for figs. Yes, that's true. But when a fig tree, it's just the opposite of most trees. When a fig tree, it puts on fruit first, and then it puts on leaves, where most trees put on leaves and then fruit. So when he saw leaves on it, whether it was the season or not, it came into early season. And therefore, if it had leaves on it, it had fruit on it. Or it's supposed to. Because it was a fig tree. But Jesus walks up to this tree that showed every evidence and every sign of having figs, and it had none. You say, well, that's not a big deal. No, he cursed it. No one ever in the whole history of mankind will ever eat from you again. Wow, what's, what's the big deal? You know, it just didn't have any fruit. Yeah, but it was symbolic for Israel and for us. Listen to the first message. The first message is this. If you've got all the show, you've got all the religion, you've got all the Christianity, you've got your Bible, you've got the prayer thing down, but you don't have any fruit, that's a dangerous situation. For Israel and for us. This isn't a, you know, a small matter. He said... You know, you showed every sign by me walking up to you that you ought to have fruit. That's the only reason he walked up there. If it had no leaves, he wouldn't even walk there. But he said, hey, it's got leaves, so it's got fruit. And he looked, and there was none. So he says, because you had every thing to grow fruit and every capability to grow fruit, you're cursed. You're going to never, ever produce fruit. Nobody will ever eat fruit from you again. It says the disciples were listening. So this curse was placed upon him. And then I call the next aspect the curiosity the curiosity. Of course, we dropped, jumped over a few verses because Jesus, in between that, cleansed the temple in between those verses. And so after he had cursed it one day, he cleansed the temple, and then the very next day, in other words, just one day after the cursing, we pick up in Mark eleven twenty. And as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree, that's the one he cursed, withered from the roots up, being reminded... Peter, being, being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you have cursed withered. So Peter points it out. Say, hey, there's that tree. The one yesterday you cursed, it's withered. And then the next passage starts out, said, and Jesus answered them saying, now, I'm not an English major by any means, but I go back, I hadn't even seen the question. I mean, I look back and I didn't see a question mark. But Jesus, knowing Peter and being Jesus, I believe he picked up that Peter in his inflection was having a question going on here in what he said. Now, men, we know this quite well. Or if you've been married a while, you do. If you don't, you better write this down. This is a free one on this one. You know, your wife can say, I'm fine. You better know what kind of I'm fine that is. <laughs> now, it may be, uh, I'm doing great, you're a wonderful husband, and life is just fantastic, fine. 
Or it may be, if you say another word, I'm going to claw your eyeballs out of the sockets fine. Now, if you don't know the difference, you're going to have some marital issues. If you accept just I'm fine is I'm fine, you've got to look at the look and the voice and the tone and the inflection to make sure you get this I'm fine right. Are you leaving? Oh, my wife's fine. Not. Well, Jesus, knowing Peter, he could see that, G, that Peter was, in, I believe, his expression, his mannerisms, and just by knowing Peter, Peter was curious, saying, Has it already withered? This tree, it's withered. What's up with that? He said, Well, what's up? He cursed it. Yeah, but you've cut limbs down at your house. You've even cut a tree down and let it lay there. It doesn't wither over over one day. I mean, matter of fact, it'll look green and live for days and maybe even a week or so. It'll still look fine. You know, even if you cut it and lay it over, put it on a burn pile, it still looks nice for about a week. It doesn't look all withered up. It, you know, it's just got life in it. Now, it doesn't have life in it, but it shows life. So Peter's going like, how could you do this in one day and the very next day it looked withered? Now, you may not think that's a big deal, but for Peter, it was a big deal. What is up? Jeez, I'm curious. i, I got to know. How can this happen in one day's time? Well, we see that Jesus gives the conclusion. He says to Peter, he answered and said, Have faith in God. So, what's up? You want to know why that happened quick? I think Peter's going like, how can I make things happen quick? Have faith in God. That's how it happened. It withered overnight. It did the impossible. Yes, Jesus cursed it, but for it to wither overnight took more than just the natural. It took the super, of course, it took the supernatural to curse it, but it took the supernatural for it to happen that fast. And Peter, he was curious. I love Peter. A lot of people put him down. He was so curious. Yeah, he stuck his foot in his mouth, but he wanted to learn. He wanted to do. He wanted to do what Jesus did, and he said, how'd that happen? And Jesus basically was saying, you want to do that too? Have faith in God. I don't know about you, there's some things I need to happen. And in order for it to happen, I've got to have faith in God. And then he adds this. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, his Mount of Olives was near him. He's referring to that mountain. Be taken up and cast in the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says is going to happen, it will be granted him. Therefore I say to you, all things which you pray and ask, believe that you receive them, and they will be granted you. So what is he talking about? You know, I remember as a kid in Sunday school, I used to hear that and I think, I guess you've got to go someplace that has a mountain range and you can tell this mountain, you know. You know, as a kid, you just think, you know. But if you really understand the language of the day, you can understand this. It's like, what if somebody came and listened to some of the kids and stuff, you know, and, and heard them talking in the parking lot and said, man, you got a bad car, man. That is one bad car. Well, I mean, if they came from the Bible days, they'd say, man, that, that's an awful car. But the kids mean what? It's a great car. It's bad. It's bad good. You know, not bad bad. You know, but they wouldn't understand that. They need to know the today's vernacular. Well, you read this, and I read this, and I don't know the vernacular back then, but if you were to read Jewish literature, which they did, that was a common statement. They called a person who could take on an impossible task and seem to do an impossible task they called that person a rooter up of mountains. If you did something that seemed impossible, I would comment to you, I'd say, you're a rooter up of mountains. You just do the impossible. You just root up mountains. And they knew when Jesus made this statement exactly what he meant. He was meaning you can do the impossible because it's impossible to root up a mountain. And Jesus wasn't talking literally because that's what all these religious leaders wanted him to do. Do something miraculous. Show us that. That's what they'd love to have seen for him to take that mountain and chunk it over in the sea. They said, okay, now you're God. No, he wasn't going to do that to do any show. He was telling Peter 
that if you've got some mountain in your life, you think it was big for me to make a, a, a tree wither like that? You can do better than that. Remember, he even said, you're going to do greater things than I did. He said, you will be able to say to your financial mountain, your health mountain, your relationship mountain, your worry mountain, all those mountains that are in your life, you'll be able to, if you believe and don't doubt and have faith in God, you as an individual through the power of God can tell that mountain, adios amigos, and it's gone. Well, I can't do that. Well, you can't, but God in you can. And if you don't, we don't believe God. And I am guilty as anybody of doubting that, well, I guess this is something I've got to face. Well, it may not be. God may be saying, why don't you just get rid of it? Well, I'd like that. Well, here's what he's telling me. He's giving me a word to say if I believe it and ask for it, it'll be granted to me. And it's amazing to think about the sovereignty of God. You know, God does what he wants. When he wants, how he wants, whenever he wants, I don't care what I do, don't do, what this nation does, what this country is. God's all sovereign. He's taking care of business the way he wants to. Nobody's causing him, making him do anything. But to just realize that sovereign God can listen to a prayer by just a flawed human being and that make a difference in what God does is mind-blowing. It's just mind-blowing that he would, in his greatness, would allow me to go to him and say, Lord, would you do that? And he would say, I'm going to do that because you prayed for it and asked for it. And if you wouldn't have in this situation, it wouldn't have happened. But he's still sovereign because he chose to, in his own will and volition, to hear my prayer and it make a difference. I'm not powerful. He's powerful. But he's the one that asked me to do it, not me. I didn't go saying, God, I asked. God said, no, I asked you to ask. Because I want to do it. I want to move the mountain. But there's some mountains that won't get moved unless I ask. I say, I guess I'm just destined to have this mountain. Well, it may be one that's just ready for it to be spoken to and moved. Well, it wouldn't be a shame for me to go to heaven and not to, let me phrase that. It's not be a shame to go to heaven, but to go to heaven and hear, you know, those, those three things that you live with for all your life, I was ready to take them out. I was ready to cast them out in the sea, those mountain problems you had. But you didn't ask or you didn't believe, and so they stayed there. That'd be a shame. So let's look, because I want to have that mountain-moving faith. So let's look at these three aspects, because I think if we don't have these three aspects, those mountains won't move. What are they? First of all, it's to seek His will faithfully. 1 John 5, 14 says, this is the confidence, we have confidence, which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So we've got to do it according to his will, not our will. You heard, you've heard throughout scripture this phrase, whatever you ask in his name, Whatever you ask in his name, he'll do it. That's why a lot of people think that when they pray, they said, da, 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 da. in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I covered that when he'll do it because I said it in his name. No, that means according to his will. That means what he wants. What does God want? What is his will? What does he desire to happen? That's what we pray. And when we look at that mountain, we first have to say, Lord, is it your will for this mountain to be removed? Or is it just what I want? Lord, I want what you want. I want this thing to get out of here, but I've got to determine if it's your will. Now, first of all, I think, first of all, are you faithfully doing every other thing that is his will? See, a lot of times we're saying, God, I want your will in this situation. Right here, I want your will. And then we're saying, I'm ignoring all this other will. You've got to be faithfully wanting to do the will of God in all areas. I mean, here you are praying and God may be saying, well, why don't, you're not faithfully doing the will I have. You do realize when Jesus spoke about Finally, any up in heaven, he, he said, the man that said, got said to by the, by the master, well done, thy every other Sunday, every now and then, kind of do it when you want to kind of servant. No, he said, well done, thy good and faithful servant. You faithfully take care of things. And then he went on to say, basically, you know, he said, because you've been faithful in these little things, I'm going to let you be ruling over many things. In other words, 
if you're faithfully obeying all these things, maybe God can allow you more things to be faithful for. I think part of what we say when we say we're praying according to His will is what I'm asking for God's will and also am I faithfully carrying out His will in the other areas that are in the Bible that He wants me to do. He may be saying, look, Tim, I have answered your will the last time you prayed, but you're not faithfully doing what I asked you to do when I answered it. And so here I am asking him to be faithful in answering my prayer. We've got to be faithful. We've got to realize that it's his will that's more important than our will. Isn't that how Jesus prayed? Not my will, but yours be done. You know, I think you can, it's best illustrated in the man. He was a rich man, wealthy. He had all these mansions and yachts, and he had one of the world's greatest art collections, Rembrandt, Van Gogh, all the great artists. He had one of the world's greatest collections of expensive classic art. And his son went to war and was killed in, in battle. And, and one day he got this knock on the door after about six months of his getting notice that his son had died. And the man knocked on his door and he said, Sir, I, I served with your son in, in the military. And he said, uh, uh, said I, I'm sorry to hear about your, your son because uh, he died. And, he, and your son saved my life. He said, I'm so grateful. He said, I'm not much of an artist, but while we were friends, I, I did the best I could because I like to play around with art. I'm not that good, but I drew this picture of him in his uniform and, and I, I just thought you would want to have it. And he handed the man. The man just broke down in tears and said, what, what do I owe you for this? He said, you don't owe me anything. Your son, you know, risked his life for me. I, this is just what I want you to have. So he took the painting and proudly put it on his mantle there on his fireplace. Not long after that, the man himself died. And he had all of his possessions auctioned, uh, all of his yachts and everything, and, and especially his, the word got out that they were auctioning off all of this famous classic paintings. And so people from all over the world flew in for this auction. And so the auctioneer began to do things. And even the man who drew the painting of his son thought, you know, I can't afford any of this, but it'd be interesting just to go and watch because I like art and I'm not that good. I'm just a little amateur, but it'd be great to just watch these people bid and see all this great painting. So he, he showed up at the auction just to observe. Well, the first painting they put up was his, a picture of his son. You know, and so people are hollering in the back, get rid of that junk. We want the masterpieces. Get rid of that. We don't have time for that. And the auctioneer didn't pay any mind. He said, we're auctioning this first. So start the bidding, $10, $10, $10 going one. Well, the man that drew the painting and loved the son, you know, thought, man, nobody's going to bid higher than 10 This is my painting. I mean, I, I'd like to have it. I got 10 bucks, so he bid. He raised his hand, $10. Now I hear 20, 20 going, 20, 20 going. Nobody bid any higher. Sold for $10. So he got the painting. And everybody hollered back, let's get on the ball. Let's get the real masterpieces. We're ready to bid on the real stuff. Come on, we've traveled all over the world to bid. And the auctioneer took his gavel and he hit the, said, auction closed. And everybody fussed and hollered, what do you mean auction closed? We hadn't even bid on the first thing yet. Said the owner of the, all this property left specific instructions in his will that said, Whoever gets the son gets it all. Whoever gets the son gets it all. Whoever thought the most about my son will get it all. And that's when we pray according to the will of God. We're putting Christ first. It's His interest first. And yes, when we put His interest first, I believe God will bless us in various ways. But first of all, he who gets the son first may get the rest. Isn't that what Jesus said? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added unto you. Put his will before our own. Put his will first. Find out what he wants in this situation before the mountains move. Find out it is his will for that mountain to be moved. The second thing is steadfastly pursue. 
That's another word for wait. And keep on waiting and keep on praying and keep on asking and keep on seeking the Lord. You know, Jesus tells the parable in Luke 18 of the woman, the widow who came to the judge, which is described as an unjust or an unrighteous judge. He wasn't, he wasn't good at all. And so the widow comes to him because she had an enemy, an adversary that she needed a protective order against. She needed some protection from the judge. And the judge was unwilling. and He didn't want to give her that legal protection. And so she comes back and she comes back and she comes back and she comes back and over and over asking him for this protection. And finally that judge, that unjust, unrighteous judge, basically said, man, I'm going to give in. This lady's bothering me. She's continually wearing me out by her perpetual coming over and over. And I don't even, you don't want to see her anymore. Here, here's your protective order. And Jesus said, listen to what the judge said. He wasn't comparing the judge to God. He was contrasting the judge to God, saying, Basically, this man gave her what you want because of the continual coming. And he basically said that if God hears the cry of his people day and night, day and night, day and night, he will also give deliverance or speedy answer to his children, unlike the judge who did it, because he just didn't want to be bothered anymore and it was wearing him out, God will give it to us, not because we're bothering God coming to him all the time, not because we're wearying God anymore, but because God wants to give us the answer. Why? He's giving an illustration on prayer. You can't give up. You've got to stay with it. You've got to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on praying, because that mountain may be moved, but it's not going to be moved today. Matter of fact, even in studying for this, God spoke to me about a picture matter I'd stopped praying for. Why? Because I was done. I had prayed too long, and I guess I just thought, well, I'm not even going to pray for that anymore. I just, it's just not happening. He brought back to my remembrance to say, you need to keep praying for that some more. But you know how it is. You pray for something so long, you just think, well, I guess that's it. It's not going to happen. And he spoke to my heart to say, no, you keep on coming. And you keep on asking because this mountain may not be moved today, but it may be moved tomorrow. It may be one more day of prayer and it'll finally get moved. You know, Jesus wrapped up in this little parable said, when the Son of Man, will the, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on earth? Do you know when Jesus comes back, is he going to find this kind of faith? That widow just kept coming and coming and coming because she was believing even in that unjust judge to give her her answer. Will, will we be found that way, that we keep coming and coming and coming to God on a particular matter for him to move that mountain? You know, it says that the day when Jesus comes will be like the days of Noah. It's going to rain. We don't believe that. That's why only eight people got on that boat. Because all the rest of the world said, it's not going to rain, we've never seen rain. Well, I believe it's going to rain. But eight people put faith, and it's going to be like the days of Noah when Jesus comes back. Will he find faith on earth like this from us? That we said, we're going to keep asking, we're going to keep praying, we're going to keep believing. And then the last thing, not only seek God's will faithfully, steadfastly pursue, I think we've got to size things up. I think this is where most people don't get their mountain moved and they live with their mountain. When God wants it out of the way, maybe, if it's His will. Well, we've got to size things up. Remember in the story we just read, when Jesus had the conclusion, He told Peter, He answered them and said, Have faith in God. See, a lot of people, when they have faith, you know what they're really having faith in? Themselves. I've been a Christian long enough. I've been saved long enough. I know the Bible enough. I know how it works, and so I'm going to get this thing done. That's having faith in you. You know what a lot of people do? They have faith in faith. A lot of people have faith in faith. I've got a lot of faith. I'm believing in my faith. I know I've got enough faith. Here's what I'm going to do with my faith. That's just having faith in faith. And that's not what Jesus said either. He said... Have faith in God. Size things up. Quit looking at you. 
Quit looking at your faith because you don't look small. Your faith is going to look small, but your God's always going to look big. So have faith, size things up. How big is your mountain and how big is your God? Well, my mountain's never as big as my God. My God's always bigger than my mountain. I mean, look at all the people that demonstrated this. Look at David. He had a mountain. You know what his mountain name was? Goliath. He had a Goliath mountain that he faced. And so that wasn't a big mountain. Excuse me? Goliath, nine foot nine. I mean, we call guys six foot five big guys. I mean, a guy occasionally gets seven foot and we'll think that's big. Nine foot nine. The guy's head was three inches below the rim of a basketball goal. His head. He was three inches short of being ten foot. I mean, dunk, he could dunk with his mouth. He could spit the ball in the goal. I mean, that's just the guy's... His armor weighed 125 pounds. If you can walk around and, not, and be comfortable with a 125-pound jacket, you're a bad dude. And I'm talking about bad being bad. You're a bad dude if you can carry a 125-pound armor coat and just be comfortable in it. And your javelin end weighed 15 pounds. That's, this guy was... He's a giant. <laughs> he was a giant. And, and little bitty, ruddy little boy, David. David was little. His mountain was big. God planned it that way. He likes little versus big. And you know what? Even before David went out there, you know what he said? Most people miss this. He began, before he ever went out to Goliath, you remember he's telling people, God's already saved me from the bear and the lion. I took them down already. They came after my lambs, and God helped me kill a bear and a lion. You know what he was saying? He was saying this, and here's a side note. This is a free sermon. The side note is, why don't you look where God's already done so that you can say, man, he already did those things. That builds my faith that he can do all these other things. Now, if you don't have any list of what he's already done when you've asked him, then you need to start asking to see what he can do. See, so his background's already said, God's already took care of lion and bear. So this guy here, he's going down. And so he goes out there, and of course, Goliath already looks at him and said, man, who am I, dog? You coming out here with sticks? I mean, he was basically saying, is this your best guy you got, this little bitty boy? I mean, send out somebody bigger than this because I'm a big dude. But it doesn't intimidate David. He looks at him. He said, you come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin. You're a big dude. You got big equipment. But I come to you, he said, in the name of the Lord of hosts. You come to me with some big, heavy equipment. You come to me and you're a big giant. But I come to you in something bigger than you. I come to you in a name. Said, That's no big deal. It is a big deal. He said, I'm coming to you in the big God of Israel. And you going down, I'm fixing to take your head off. And I'm going to feed you to the birds. What did he do? He told his mountain, adios amigos. I'm not going to take this mountain. You're here, you're hindering me, you're hindering Israel, and I'm not going to take it anymore. He said, yeah, but he was a... All he had was some little bitty rocks. And you, unless you hit him right where you need to hit him, it's going to be like a mosquito bite. But God took that pebble to put it in the right place, and he went down. Because David said, you're a big mountain, but I'm not going to live my life with you you are going down. You, mountain, are going to be cast into the sea by the power of my God. And he went down. It was so funny because Goliath had just told David the same thing. I'm going to feed you to the birds. That's what your mountain ends up telling you. Saying, you can't do this. You've lived with this long enough. Your mountain's always speaking back to you, but David spoke back to it. 
said, no, my God's taken you down. And he went and he served. Why? Because he wasn't focused. He sized things up. How big is Goliath? One big dude. How big is my God? Bigger than Goliath. We're going to go with this. I'm going out here and doing it. And so his mountain went down. Gideon. I mean, Gideon was a nervous, worrisome guy. And, and God puts him in charge. And he didn't have a Goliath mountain. He had a Midianite mountain. Here are the Midianites, at least, if you read later in Scripture from this passage, they had at least 135,000 men. You know what? Gideon had 32,000 men. If you do the math, he's about 100,000 men short. And when you're hand-to-hand -hand warfare, that's a big mountain. If you've got 32,000, they've got 135,000. You're over 100,000 men outnumbered. That's not good. You say, well, let's see what we can do. No, let's see what God did. God says to Gideon, you've got too many. I need to grow your mountain. Anybody can, I, can witness to say, I feel, I feel like God's growing my mountain? That's what God did. God said, 32,000 is too many. Let's bump you down to 300 against 135. Let's get you down real low. You say, what's God doing? He's building up his mountain. You know why he said? He said, you got too many. Lest you go out there to battle and Israel get the glory and say that their hand did it. See, if I let you with 32,000, even though 135, and you win, you may say, oh, we're some good warriors. I'm not going to allow that to happen. I'm going to build your mountain up so big that when it happens, you'll have to give me the glory because I'm the only one that can do it. That's what a mountain is, an impossible situation. So now here he is with 300 men. But guess what happened? His mountain went down. And God got the glory. Sometimes I think, Lord... Are things going in the right direction? Because this mountain looks like it's going this way, not that way. That's the sea. That's where I need to cast it. And it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I keep praying it'll get smaller and get out of here. Maybe God's doing to us as he did to Gideon and said, let me get it big enough so that when I knock it down, boom, I get the glory and nobody else. Because that's what we live for is the glory of God. Man, you think of Jonathan and his armor bearer. Man, they faced a Philistine mountain. I mean, these Philistines were everywhere. I mean, they had, they had 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and check out the number of the people. They didn't give a number. You know what the Scripture said? As, as numerous as the sands on the seashore. <laughs> That's a big number. The Bible doesn't even give the number. As numerous as sands on the seashore. That's the people beside the chariots and the horsemen. Man, this is impossible. This is a big mountain. So you know what Jonathan and his armor bearer say? Jonathan says his armor bearer. Basically this. Let's go fight them, just me and you. I'm sure his armor bearer must have hit me. I'd be saying, man, you've been smoking some dope? <laughs> me and you against... I mean, that was worse odds than Gideon had. Just me and you? I mean, that's what I'd been saying. I'd been saying, good luck, buddy. Let me know how that works out for you because I'm heading back to the camp, you know. I'm not going to. And Jonathan made, I believe, one of the greatest statements in all of Scripture. You know what he says? He said, basically, can anything hinder God from saving by many or by few. Think about it. Think about that great statement. I've just, I love that statement. Can anything hinder God from saving by many or few? He deduced it. He said, think about it. Why can't God just use me and you? Is God hindered? Does he need 10,000 men, 5,000 men, 100,000 men? Or God just needs one person or two to handle the whole army? You know what he did? You know why God moved on his? Because he sized things up. He says, me and you, Mr. Armor Bearer, against the entire Philistine army, no big deal. They are big, but my God is bigger, and we're going to say to that mountain, be removed. They went out there, and they had victory. God can kill an entire army with just two people going out in faith. Because he's God. Amen. Give him the glory. He's a big God. And you say this morning, well, Brother Tim, well, with that mountain, 
always leave? No, it may not. One, it may not be God's will. Or, it may not be God's will right now. But it may be later. But whatever the case, God's going to work it out for your good. But my point is this. If it's a mountain that God wants me to remove, wants to, wants to remove for me, then I need to move out and get that mountain out of the way if that's one of the mountains that he wants me to get removed with his power. And I don't want to look back and say, you know, that mountain, he was waiting on me to, to, to ask him to remove. Now, if it's his, not his will and I've got to live with it, he'll give me the strength to do it. And may not, I may not know which mountain it is, but I'm going to say to all of them, be removed. And I want to see if this verse, because I want to have faith in this verse, that maybe it's time after I've heard this to get some of these mountains out of there and tell them to hit the trail. Because God doesn't want you here. And if it doesn't go, then I'm going to keep praying, keep asking until God determines to me that it's not His will. You know, Paul prayed three times that the thorn in the flesh would go. And God finally said, this, one, this mountain's not going to go, this one. And a lot of Paul had answered prayer for sure. But he said, this one's not going, this one's going to stay. But I'm going to use it. He used it for Paul's good, even though he let it stay. So if that mountain doesn't go, then I know it's going to be used for my good. What's your mountain? Is it financial? Is it health? Is it relationship? Is it work? Is it loneliness? Is it frustration? Is it a child, a wayward child? Is it a wayward spouse? What is it? What is it that's standing there as your mountain? Do you realize that if God never put a mountain in your life, you could never give testimony that you had it, he cast it into the sea. I don't like mountains any more than you do. I hate them. And I know that if God never put a mountain in my life, I could never see the power of God to move mountains so that I would never be able to tell anybody, here's what God did for me. Because God would have killed Tim Strickland the day he got saved if he didn't believe that maybe his life would glorify him. And one way that our lives glorify God is when we brag on God and to say, here was a mountain that could not be removed and could not be dealt with because it was an impossible situation, but God did it. Amen. Amen. Give God the glory. And I want God to get that kind of glory. And this morning, maybe you face that mountain. An encouragement for you today is to say, I'm going to believe God in this matter, and I'm not going to give up, and I'm going to keep praying, and I'm going to seek His will, and I want to give testimony before people when He gets this mountain removed. If this is a mountain, according to His will, that's supposed to get out of my life. Will we believe God? With every head bowed and every eye closed, as you stand to your feet,